Welcome to Historically Speaking. Our episode this month is Ephemera, Conduit to the Past. And specifically, we are going to be taking a long look at a very fragile document that certainly qualifies as an example of ephemera. Before we get to the specifics, let's just experience what ephemeral documents are. A while ago, a family member, the last in her branch of the family, gave me a Bible, not in any way connected to me, but since it was so beautifully bound, it's not anything that I could throw away. And one of the most enjoyable aspects of uh, going through the pages in this Bible there were some uh, wonderful little pieces of paper that were sentimental verses. Sometimes they would have been um, little cards. And also this is uh, probably a birthday wish. And the reason that these items were preserved is that they were tucked in the pages of the Bible. So the story behind this item that you see here, this is a slim booklet, about 12 folded pages. It's very typically Victorian with the fringe that you see around the edges. The cover of it is in color, and it's an elaborate illustrated copy of a poem called Rock Me to Sleep Mother. What's the background of this? Several weeks ago, a very good friend of mine, uh, Linda Coolis and her husband, Russell, are moving. They're downsizing. And as part of that process, which is never easy for anyone at any time, there were many family treasures. Do you decide to keep? Do you decide to give them to someone? And Linda, knowing my love of history, um, asked me, or she said, I will loan you this item so you can examine it a little bit. And this is what we need to do sometimes before we just toss something that may be in fragile condition it's very much worthwhile for us to fully understand what it is, who created it, and why in the context of its time, a document like this was enormously popular. So the poem, Rock Me to Sleep, Mother. The book opens with a frontispiece inscription and it says, as you can see at left here, from Louise Vigeron to Mrs. A. E. Dillenbeck, December 25th, 1885. I knew from what Linda had told me that Mrs. A. E. Dillenbeck was her great-great-grandmother who lived in upstate New York. Interestingly, her first name was Amelia. She had married in 1856, but was a widow by 1863. I'm not sure why, uh, what her husband Alva Dillenbeck died of, but for the rest of her long life, she was always known formally, not as Amelia Dillenbeck, but as Mrs. Alva E. Dillenbeck. The person that gave this to her was Louise Vigeron. Now here's the strange thing. I don't think Louise wrote this. How do I know this? Because I found Louise's gravestone and the spelling of the name is different. So although this is described, which gives us the uh, context of how uh, the book came into Mrs. Dillenbeck's possession. I think Mrs. Dillenbeck wrote this, but did not spell her, her friend's name correctly. Here is the opening uh, 
copyright page of the book Rock Me to Sleep Mother by Elizabeth Akers Allen, illustrated. This is a large part of what we will be discussing today. And this was published in Boston in 1884. So the question before we delve into the contents of the book that you might pose, has anyone in Rutland or did anyone in Greater Rutland read this book? Well, I have the answer because I have here a front page from the Rutland Herald in 1860. And here is the poem on the front page of the Rutland Herald and Rock Me to Sleep by Florence Perry by, from the Saturday Evening Post. And this would be uh, a problem later on that I will explain because originally when the author wrote this poem in 1857, she published under a pseudonym named Florence Perry. So we can see that for this poem to be reissued years later in this illustrated booklet, it certainly attests to the popularity of the poem. In the first engraved image that we see here of this angel, this to me is very much uh, indicative of the type of art that we would have seen um, that would have qualified as high Victorian, pre-Raphaelite, a lot of ethereal looking angels. And what we have here is an angel looking down at what I believe is a cradle and a baby in it. And once again, we have a fuller elaboration of what is in this little booklet. And we have six different illustrators here. And I'm curious to know if some of them who give just initials like S.G. McGutchen and F.S. Church and W.L. Taylor, if some of these might have been women. Because certainly one of the things that this booklet is evocative of is the world of women. I'm going to read the poem to you now in its entirety. And for me, this is somewhat of a departure from the way that I usually uh, taught poetry. Because sometimes I would always begin with an introduction to the life of the poet and some background to establish context. But the longer I taught, I thought it would be far more valuable to first just experience the poem and then go back and do some analysis. So here is the poem, Rock Me to Sleep, Mother. Backward, turn backward, O time in your flight. Make me a child again just for tonight. Mother, come back from the echoless shore. Take me again to your heart as of yore. Kiss from my forehead the furrows of care. Smooth the few silver threads out of my hair. Over my slumbers your loving watch keep. Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. Backward, flow backward, O tide of the years. I am so weary of toil and of tears. Toil without recompense, tears all in vain. Take them and give me my childhood again. I have grown weary of dust and decay, weary of flinging my soul wealth away, weary of sowing for others to reap. Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. Tired of this hollow, the base, the untrue, mother, oh mother, my heart calls for you. Many a summer the grass has grown green, blossomed and faded our faces between. Yet with strong yearning and passionate pain, long I tonight for your presence again. Come from the silence so long and so deep, rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. Over my heart in the days that are flown, no love like mother love has ever shown. 
No worship abides and endures, faithful, unselfish, and patient like yours. None like a mother can charm away pain from the sick soul and world-weary brain. Slumber's soft calms o'er my heavy lids creep. Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. Come, let your, let your brown hair just lighted with gold fall on your shoulders again as of old. Let it drop over my forehead tonight, shading my faint eyes away from the light. For with its sunny edge shadows once more, haply will throng the sweet visions of yore. Lovingly, softly, its bright billows sweep. Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. Mother dear, the years have been long since I last listened your holiday, your lullaby song. Sing then unto my soul it shall seem, womanhood's years have only been a dream. Clasped to your heart in a loving embrace, with your light lashes just sweeping my face. Never hereafter to wake or to sleep. Rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. As you have heard, this poem has a very uh, lyrical, metrical beat to it. It consists of six stanzas, eight lines each, regular rhyme schemes, A, A, B, B, and each stanza ends with a couplet of rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. And uh, even though I may have faltered a bit here and there, for the most part, this poem is written entirely in iambic pentameter with the author carefully choosing the stressed and unstressed syllables. So as heard, you get the sense of a rocking lullaby motion, which you can see from the little illustration at the top of the page. As we move through the booklet, uh, we can see how the various images uh, really dovetail beautifully with the text itself. So in that opening line, backward, turn backward, O time in your flight, we have the personification of time here. So we have Father Time with his scythe, which I think is an image of time stealing away someone's life. And the plaint that the author makes throughout the poem is that whatever her sadness is, she wants to go back to childhood, um, make me a child again just for tonight. She wants her mother to come back from this kind of poetic evocation of paradise, come back from the echoless shore. And in this picture, you can see very much uh, a plaintive picture uh, of the woman, possibly a stand-in for the poet herself in her rocking chair, uh, looking very, very mournful, once again, um, longingly pleading for her mother to come back and to comfort her. Here we have another angelic image of the woman um, in repose. And since the woman's mother has uh, passed away before the time uh, that the poem was written, we can see this angelic comforter coming to give solace to the woman. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner of the illustration, you have a picture of a woman, and I dare say this is probably uh, the poet's mother. I am so weary of toil and of tears. So here you have the same woman looking wistfully out of the window. And I think putting this in the context of something that is written in the middle of the 19th century and perhaps one of the reasons why in its time that this poem was so popular with its audience, there was much in the lives of women and mothers to be sorrowful about. 
and, and certainly one of the grim realities of any 19th century mother, uh, regardless of social class, virtually every mother would have buried one or more of her children. And that would be the case in one instance with the poet herself. We also know from biography, which I'll give you a little bit later, that after some circumstances that were very sad in the author's life, she undertook a tour of Italy. So the illustrator here, if you notice, has a ruined Greco-Roman temple, backward flow backward, O tide of the years. So we have this image from the classical past. We have the little um, vignette in the middle. I have grown weary of dust and decay. The image of uh, something that is sown without seeds germinating. So it's kind of the poet's sense that her efforts have been expended uh, and come to naught. Another wistful picture here of probably by a different artist because the woman is outdoors. It's a little less dreary than some of the interior pictures. In many a summer, the grass has grown green, but if we notice, the young woman is gazing towards the graveyard. Tired of the hollow that based the untrue, mother, oh mother, my heart calls for you. Many a summer, the grass has grown green, blossomed and faded, our faces between. Many poetic devices here, repetition, and it's this repetition that I think mimics the lullaby motion of the poem itself. Once again, uh, an image here uh, of a wistful woman in a, uh, the architecture certainly fits the time period of a high Victorian sideboard, which we can see uh, at the left of the picture. Long I tonight for your presence again. Another image of what I would label as the uh, cult of domesticity. So here you have the mother reading, the daughter dutifully uh, cradling, uh, having her head cradled in her mother's lap. It looks like the daughter uh, has been interrupted in her reading to be comforted by her mother. And as part of the whole rhythm of the poem, we can see that the mother here is not sitting in a regular chair, but a rocking chair. Again, a similar theme here. No love like the mother love ever has shown. An image of a mother and her child. This is probably a more uplifting image. And I could probably, uh, if I look carefully, could categorize the more uplifting images from uh, the same artist. So haply will throng the sweet visions of yore. So very much a scene that is uh, bucolic, pastoral, beautiful, uh, exchange of flowers, very much a happy image. Back to angels here, come let your brown hair, just lighted with gold, fall on your shoulders again as of old. Let it drop over my forehead tonight, shading my faint eyes away from the light. In these angels that we see here, I've already mentioned that they are very much evocative of the pre-Raphaelite paintings, such as those of Dante uh, Gabriel Rossetti. For with its sunny edge shadows, once more haply will throng the sweet visions of yore. Again, another very, very wistful image that ends with rock me to sleep, mother, rock me to sleep. And again, a nostalgic image here uh, with many um, observable uh, cues here about the world uh, of women, the mother in her uh, rocking chair. And if you notice, on the table 
are tools of embroidery. And then the poem concludes once again with the comfort of an angel. Mother, dear mother, the years have been long since I last listened your lullaby song. Sing then, and unto my soul it shall seem Womanshood years have been only a dream. Clasp to your heart in a loving embrace with your light lashes just sweeping my face. Never hereafter to wake or to weep. Rock me to sleep, mother. Rock me to sleep. And so the poem ends. Now let's talk about the author's uh, biography. Our poet was born as Elizabeth Ann Chase in 1832 in Strong, Franklin County, Maine. Um, her mother, who was named Mercy Barton, died when she was four years old. Some of the biographical sources say that the poet's mother died uh, when she was an infant for, I wouldn't quite say as an infant, it's questionable whether or not the poet actually remembered her own mother. We do know that uh, shortly after her mother's death, her father moved the family to Farmington, Maine. There, Elizabeth attended Farmington Academy, so she got a much better education than many women would have in the 19th century. And in 1851, uh, she married a man named Marshall Taylor. They had one daughter the following year who was named Florence Perry Taylor. After a marriage of six years, Mr. Taylor abandoned his wife and daughter and they were formally divorced. Now, for a woman to gain a divorce in the 19th century, there had to be ample cause. And I'm sure if I continue to look hard enough, uh, I will probably find some notice in a newspaper about the divorce. At this time, our poet had been publishing under the name of Florence Perry. And this would come back to haunt her a little bit later because there were so many unauthorized copies of the poem in various places when the poet herself in the 1870s attempted to say, this is my poem. She had to write pretty extensively uh, to prove that this was her um, own work. So let me give you an example here of the disputed authorship claim. This is a letter that was written to the New York Tribune in January of 1968. I observe a long title, a long article in recent issue of the Tribune concerning the authorship of the poem, Rock Me to Sleep Mother. It seems to have been claimed by a brace of authors, each of whom has probably thought that the recent internecine strike, AKA the Civil War, destroyed the other. The poem in question was written by Edward Young of Lexington, Georgia in 1859 and originally appeared uh, in the Southern Friend and Fireside printed in Augusta, Georgia. Mr. Young was a blacksmith and a printer, and I do not know how he ever obtained a name in literature, but I know I set the type from this manuscript. So here is part of the suit by which Elizabeth had to prove that she wrote it. And I don't have time to read the uh, seven column article that eventually held sway that she wrote in response to countering this claim. But I would like to go back to some elements uh, of her biography here. One of the things about the 
uh, the poem itself and its popularity and the fact that people freely borrowed from one another when things weren't copyright protected, the song, the poem, actually became one of several ballads. So here in this copy that is available through the University of Alabama Special Collections, we have it written by Florence Perry. Now a little bit more about the biography. There are many mistakes in print about the life of this poet. Uh, we do know that she was divorced from Marshall Taylor in 1857, and she went to Italy where she met her second husband, who was named Paul Akers, so hence her name, Elizabeth Akers Allen. Here is a beautiful bust that her husband sculpted of her circa 1860. This couple was only married for less than a year, where back in the United States, Paul died uh, of tuberculosis. Then um, Elizabeth married her third husband, Elijah Allen. Uh, she supported herself through her long life by continuing to write. And this is an example here of the entry that she had in a book on women writers that was published in 1893. One of the things that I will, in another venue, come back to, lots of biographical errors in what is written about this woman. For example, in this account, we have no mention of husband number one. It says that her first husband was Paul Akers, uh, the sculptor. The other thing that is a mystery I need to unravel, all of the sources claim that she had two children, one by her first husband who abandoned her, one by the second. Definitively, the child of the second marriage died, but I discovered just this morning that her daughter was named Florence Perry Taylor uh, and married twice, so obviously it is not correct when people say that this poet did not have surviving children. When the poet died in 1911, it garnered headlines um, all over the United States. In the Boston Journal, August 14th of 1911, they once again published the poem in honor of her and said that it's fitting that this beautiful verse uh, be a way to remember her going to her eternal reward. Not everyone was so kind, and this is part of the vagaries of public taste. In this mortuary notice that appeared um, in Emporia, Kansas, uh, it's a little bit snarky. It says, Elizabeth Akers Allen died a few days ago at the age of 79. She was the author of Rock Me to Sleep Mother, one of the most popular of American poems, and has kept uh, one or two generation of paradise busy. She wrote tons of poetry in her time, but only one poem escaped mediocrity. Like the author of Curfew Must Not Ring Tonight, she joins the immortals with an extremely small bundle under her arm. Ouch to that one. So with this exploration of a fragile booklet that was someone's Christmas gift in 1885, um, I hope that I have impressed upon you the value in our taking time to really fully understand and explore once were cherished objects. Thank you.